Hello, and welcome to General Biology. My name is Dave Chambers. I'll be the narrator for the voiceover PowerPoints for the course. The first unit will cover an introduction to biology, and the majority of the information in the course is coming from the textbook Campbell, Biology and Focus, and uh, the primary authors are Yuri Kane, Wasserman, Minorsky, and Reese. So with that, let's just jump right in and uh, get started with this first unit. Before we start our study of biology, I'd like to kind of put it into a, a broader context. And biology is a, is a field of study that's under a bigger umbrella, and that umbrella is science. And if you take a look at the statue to the left, hopefully what we will do a little bit of uh, along the way is is what this statue illustrates and that is to think and when we're thinking we really are in the pursuit of knowledge or knowing and so science is a way of knowing but science follows a certain set of principles or guidelines and they might be slightly different than other ways of knowing and so for example we might study life um, from a philosophical or, or uh, religious or artistic uh, perspective but because we are in a, a science class and biology is under this umbrella of science we're going to follow certain uh, guiding principles and those principles include uh, a being objective and so being objective means that we want to uh, have an accurate interpretation of uh, reality. So when we make an observation, we try to explain that observation, we don't want to interject our biases or our opinions into those uh, observations or explanations. Science should be measurable. Uh, so the things that we do in science, we would like to be able to measure them. And in general, we'll use the metric system. So you'll see those units of measurement. Celsius, meter, liter, grams, those types of units. One of the major principles of science is that it's repeatable. And so if you set up an experimental design and you're only able to do that one time and you can't get similar results when you set that experiment up again under similar conditions, then you might want to take a step back and look and see if maybe there's another variable or something else that's contributing to your results. We say science is uh, falsifiable. And so in science, sometimes, you know, we may have a certain interpretation of an observation or an explanation and we find out that it's just not so. For, so, for example, at one point we thought uh, that the Earth was the center of our solar system. But after time and careful observation and, and uh, scientific experimentation, we came to understand that uh, the sun is the, the center of our solar system. And so we will revise our understanding as new information comes in and becomes available. And so science is kind of this ongoing process and we use the scientific method really as a, as a guiding uh, set of processes to help us understand uh, as we ask these questions and formulate hypotheses and hopefully eventually arrive at uh, theories and even eventually maybe some laws. In science, uh, our explanations should conform to known natural and physical laws. So if you have an explanation in science that uh, kind of flies in the face of the law of gravity or you know, the uh, you know law of thermodynamics, uh, and those are laws are things that we know of no known exceptions in the natural or physical world. And so if you have an explanation that goes against these known natural or physical laws, you might want to take a look at that and see if maybe there's something else going on that you didn't account for. So if we look at the term biology, we notice it has a prefix and a suffix. The prefix comes to us from the Greek root bios, which translated to English means life. And the suffix from the Greek uh, root logia translates to ology in English, which means to study. And so for a long time I've been telling students that biology was the study of life. And then one day as I was reading a new edition of a textbook, uh, a sentence jumped out at me and said, biology is not the study of life. I thought, oh boy, I've been telling people the wrong thing for the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, 
And the next sentence said that biology is the scientific study of life. And I said, oh, I forgot to put that qualifier in there. And so when we look at that term scientific, that references back to those principles of science that we had just discussed. And so there are other ways to approach the study of life, say art, religion, music, all of those things are viable ways to um, try to learn and understand life in general, but they may not necessarily play by the same rules uh, when we are studying life underneath this umbrella of science. So biology is a scientific study of life. Now that we have some principles and a working definition for biology, let's look at some of the major themes. These are kind of fundamental concepts that we can hang our hat on and come back to and, and really provide the foundation and the framework as we start to look at biology and the study of living organisms and living systems. The first theme is organization. And so that's a key component of life and living systems. Information, living organisms, living systems, have to have a way to store, transfer, and copy information. And so we know that DNA really is a key component of that information theme. Energy and matter are critical to living organisms and systems. Living organisms interact with their environment and each other. And so we'll take a look at some of those as we go forward. And then of course the bedrock, the bedrock theory of biology is evolution. And if you're doing anything or trying to understand anything in biology and in the background you're not thinking a little bit about how do evolutionary processes play a role in this, you're kind of missing the boat. So evolutionary theory has been with us so 150 plus years now and that's something that we will always consider as we are looking or taking this approach to understanding life and living systems. So let's look at this first theme of organization. And this graphic kind of gives you a, oh, a, a scale of how these different living systems can be organized. The highest level of organization really is a biosphere. And the biosphere includes that thin layer of the earth and all of the life forms that exist in that layer. And then if you work your way down from the biosphere, we look at these large areas called ecosystems where we see an interaction in, with the environment between the non-living and the living components of the environment. We go down to communities and basically we're just going down step by step by step through these different systems, biological systems. Eventually we get to the cell level and the cell is kind of the, the smallest level of organization that can support all of the basic characteristics of life. Below the cell level, we start to take a look at the molecules, and you can even look at the elements or the atoms that make up the molecules in living systems. There are four major macromolecules that we find in all living systems. Those are proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. And if you want to take it a level below that, you can look at the major atoms that make up more than 95% of all living systems, and those are just four and uh, obviously one of the really important ones is carbon but also hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And you can find each one of those elements in those macromolecules above. One way to approach this study of life is called reductionism and so that's where you take kind of a larger system and break it down into its components. So for example if you wanted to understand a protein you might break it down into the amino acids and look at the amino acid sequences and how they're put together and how that relates to the structure and the function of the protein. And as we mentioned just a minute ago, uh, structure and function are related in life and in li uh, living organisms and living systems. What something looks like, its structure, is directly related to its function. And so you can see a pretty clear example of this with the interaction between the hummingbird and the flower. Obviously the hummingbird has a beak that is adapted over time to allow it to uh, extract nectar from the flower. The flower kind of has a funnel shape and the nectar's at the base and so as the hummingbird is using this long beak to get to the nectar, it's also benefiting the flower in the fact that it's picking up the pollen uh, 
and it will help when it transfers that pollen it will help the flower to basically generate genetic variability through sexual reproduction. So and a lot of times if you'll take a look not just only at organisms but even down at the molecular level uh, if we look at the structure of a, a particular protein that can give us some insight into the function of that protein as well. So structure and function are uh, tightly related in living systems. Alright, so let's take a look at the two basic types of cells. As we mentioned earlier, the cell is the smallest unit of life, uh, or the smallest unit of organization that can support life. And cells, regardless of the type, there's two basic cells, and we'll talk about those here in just a minute, but regardless of the, the type of cell, they, they share certain characteristics. And so cells have a plasma membrane. It's kind of the structure that surrounds the cell. Its main function is basically to control what comes into and out of the cell. There is a water-based fluid on the interior of the cell. And when we get past those basic characteristics, uh, we start to see a difference between the two types of cells, uh, whether or not it's a prokaryotic or eukaryotic cell. And if you look at the graphic, you can kind of see right away one of the first things that probably jumps out to you is size. Prokaryotic cells are much smaller, about one-tenth the size of eukaryotic cells, but the defining characteristics between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells is based on the presence or absence of a nucleus. Pro means pre or before, karyote means nucleus, and so prokaryotic cells do not have a membrane-bound nucleus. And if you hear prokaryote, start to make that connection to bacteria. And so, essentially, prokaryotic cells are, are the different types of bacterial cells uh, that we have on the planet. Eukaryotic cells, U means true, karyote means nucleus. So eukaryotic cells have a true membrane-bound nucleus. So the DNA is stored within an additional membrane inside the cell. So there's, a, again, a reference to the size of the prokaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells, the DNA is not enclosed in a membrane-bound nucleus. It's just loose as a one-ring chromosome. It's loose in the cytoplasm. It's called a nucleoid. Whereas in eukaryotic cells, like the cells that you have in your body, the DNA is stored in multiple linear chromosomes inside of the nucleus of the cell. In our case, in our species, Homo sapiens, in our somatic cells, or normal body cells, we have 46 linear chromosomes in the nucleus of each of our cells. The next theme is information. And information is a key uh, kind of concept in living systems. And one of the things that connects all living organisms is how we store, transfer, copy, handle information. And so all living organisms use DNA as their chemical information system. And that DNA is a component of the chromosomes. Chromosomes are really made up of a couple of different types of molecules, uh, basically DNA and primarily proteins. But the DNA is a working portion of the chromosome. And DNA controls basically three things. It controls heredity, so that's how we transfer genetic information from one generation to another. It controls cell division, and it controls protein synthesis. We'll look at the structure of the DNA molecule here in just a minute, uh, but one of the things about DNA is it's double-stranded, and because it's double-stranded, there's inherently a, a copying mechanism built in, and that copying mechanism really is the basis for reproduction. Uh, both asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction, and also cell division. Uh, two types of cell division in uh, sexually reproducing organisms, mitosis and meiosis. Those are all things that we'll talk about in uh, future units when we look a little bit more closely at DNA. So this will give you a better idea of the physical structure of the DNA molecule. It's made up of two coiled strands and they are called, it's called a double helix uh, because the uh, two strands kind of coil or twist around one another. 
that coiling or twisting is called by, caused by the unequal pull of the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. And so a lot of times DNA has been described as a ladder and you have kind of the outer supporting parts of the ladder which are made up of the phosphate and sugar backbone. And then you have the working portion of the molecule which are the nitrogen bases. The nitrogen bases in DNA there are four, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And so if you take a look at that figure 1.7 and the B uh, kind of graphic within that figure, you just see a single strand of the DNA molecule. There would actually be a complementary strand to that where, we, where you would have the complementary nitrogenous bases and then the phosphate and sugar backbone on the outside of that. Adenine combines with thymine, cytosine with guanine. And so they have a definitive way of combining a certain number of hydrogen bonds between them. DNA is made up of what they call genes. And genes are essentially just sequences of nitrogenous bases. This is the blueprint. This is the chemical information uh, system that provides you know, the, the information for building proteins. It also, again, controls heredity and cell division, but it's that series of nitrogen bases that dictates uh, the sequence and the types of amino acids and how they will be put together. And so those genes are really the information for building the proteins. And once those proteins are assembled, you see them expressed as physical traits things like hair color, eye color, attached, unattached earlobes, oh, even the number of fast twitch versus slow twitch muscle fibers, all of these physical traits that you see expressed, the information for those proteins that are expressed as traits basically is stored in that series or that sequence of nitrogenous bases in the DNA molecule. RNA plays a role as well. RNA kind of is uh, the gopher and kind of the workhorse of gene expression. And so the information kind of moves through this uh, sequence of events where it starts out as DNA, it's transcribed into RNA and translated from RNA eventually into the, the finished product, which is a protein. We'll, we'll all see this as well as we in a little bit more detail or actually quite a bit more detail as we go forward. That process is called gene expression. Alright so on to the next theme which is energy and matter. And so one of the key aspects of living organisms or living systems is that they require energy uh, to maintain organization. And as we go through these themes you'll see that they overlap and there's a relationship between these different themes and so we've talked about organization and information and now we're looking at energy but there is a connection an underlying connection with all of these themes there's essentially two ways that organisms acquire energy and uh, if you will take a look at these terms heterotroph and autotroph these are terms that you need to remember and again the vocabulary it's really important that you get a grasp of this vocabulary if you haven't seen it before things like prokaryote, eukaryote, heterotroph, autotroph those are going to be critical terms that will help you to to understand the information and also start to put some processes together as we get further into the class so heterotrophs are organisms like you and I hetero means other or different, troph means to nourish and so heterotrophic organisms rely on outside uh, sources for their nutrients. They're not capable of making energy uh, from atmospheric, source, atmospheric sources. They have to have a little bit of help. So they feed on or absorb nutrients from other organisms. Auto means self. Again, troph means to nourish. And so autotrophs are these producers. Essentially, they're capable of making their own nutrients from what's available to them in the atmosphere and in their environment. And so auto is self, troph is to nourish. And the process that autotrophic organisms use, as you might guess, is photosynthesis.
So as we look at energy and matter a little bit more closely, energy flows through uh, basically the biosphere matter cycles. And so we know from the first law of thermodynamics, energy can't be created or destroyed, but it can be transformed. And so energy is transformed as it comes into the uh, Earth's biosphere. The majority of the energy entering the Earth's biosphere comes in as solar energy. And that solar energy is basically converted to chemical energy. So light energy or solar energy is converted to chemical energy by autotrophs or producers. And the autotrophs and the producers are things like cyanobacteria and algae and plants, which we're a little bit more familiar with. And uh, so this chemical energy that basically is uh, generated by autotrophs, the primary producers, is picked up and used uh, by the consumers. And so make sure that you can kind of tie these terms that we've talked about uh, together. And so autotrophs, if you hear autotroph, those are organisms that are self-feeders. They can do photosynthesis. They're primary producers. Heterotrophs rely on outside sources, energy that's produced by the autotrophs. And so the heterotrophs would be considered uh, to be consumers. If you take a look at this diagram, kind of at the bottom, figure 1.9, uh, energy comes in as light, it's converted to uh, chemical energy, and then it's either used as kinetic energy and or dissipated as heat as it moves through the system. So this just kind of uh, shows in a little bit more detail what we had talked about earlier. Energy flows through an ecosystem, uh, coming in as light or solar energy. It's uh, converted to chemical energy by the autotrophs or the producers, and then it leaves the system as heat if it's not used as uh, like kinetic energy. Chemical elements, on the other hand, are recycled within an ecosystem. And think about some of the important elements that are recycled. And so those are things like carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus, and really important uh, organisms involved in this nutrient cycle include things like uh, bacteria and fungi and so those organisms help to break down more complex molecules and then recycle them and make them available to uh, to other organisms in the system. The next thing the, the next thing that we'll look at is interactions and so living organisms, living systems respond to changes in their environment. They respond to stimuli. And so organisms interact with one another and their environment. The environment's really made up of two parts. It's made up of what we would consider to be the abiotic factors. A means without, bio is life. And so one component of your environment are these non-living factors. So things like sunlight, shade, soil, water, all important components of the environment but non-living. And then you have the living components of the environment. The producers, the consumers, the decomposers, uh, the microorganisms, the plants and the animals and the fungi. Those are the biotic components of the environment. And all of these components are interacting with one another. So for example, a really important interaction that and critical to sustaining and supporting life on the planet is this interaction between plants and their environment where plants will take up water and minerals from the soil and CO2 from the air and then release oxygen and that oxygen then becomes available to other organisms like ourselves who use it for cellular respiration. I think one of the big misconceptions too and I don't want you to uh, to kind of think this, but plants use carbon dioxide, but they also use oxygen. And so it's, um, they give off oxygen as a byproduct, uh, but they will also uh, use oxygen when they do cellular respiration. So uh, plants really run that uh, energy 
equation both directions. They do photosynthesis using carbon dioxide, water, and solar energy, generating glucose and oxygen as a byproduct, but they still have to turn that around and run it in the opposite direction and do cell respiration where they break down that glucose in the presence of oxygen and uh, generate the ultimate energy source for all living organisms, which is ATP, uh, denison triphosphate. A uh, couple of examples of interactions here. And so you can see here you have a sea turtle and it almost looks as if he's being accosted by these uh, marine fish. Uh, but these fish are actually, this is an interaction that's actually beneficial to both of those organisms. The fish aren't parasites, they're not trying to eat the turtle, they're actually um, taking or eating the parasites that are living on the, the turtle shell. And so, and under this type of interaction you see you know, what we would call a plus-plus or mutually beneficial or mutualistic symbiosis the fish are getting something to eat, uh, but the turtle's also getting a cleaning and some parasites removed along the way. Uh, some interactions can be uh, what we would call a plus zero, where one organism clearly benefits and the other really isn't affected. Probably the shark and the remora, or more commonly called a sucker fish, would be an example of like a, a plus zero type of interaction where the shark really isn't having any detrimental effects from the remora, but the remora is basically getting a free meal as the shark is uh, not exactly a neat and clean eater as he, uh, as he consumes his nutrients. And so the remora is kind of just hanging around for uh, a free meal. And then we can also have plus minus uh, types of interactions in the environment. And this would be, an example of this would be like a, a host and a parasite. And we're pretty familiar with the parasites. There's, you know, obviously a lot of those can be uh, detrimental to us and be uh, vectors for diseases. But if you think about it, like a mammal and a tick or, you know, uh, an animal and a, a mosquito. And we also see things like intestinal parasites uh, with hookworms and, uh, flukes and a whole variety of those organisms that uh, that can be detrimental to the host. So that would be an example of a where one organism benefits and the others uh, harmed. Interactions affect individual organisms and the uh, the way that populations evolve. And so a lot of times these interactions, you know, you can get what's called uh, coevolution. And so you know, adaptations in the host might drive adaptations in the parasite and, uh, and vice versa. And that can contribute to evolution in both species. One of the, probably the biggest interactions and the biggest impacts that we're having today on the planet is how we are uh, basically interacting with our environment as a species. And so Homo sapiens, uh, obviously, uh, we have, there's a lot of us, seven plus billion people on the planet, uh, but because of our intelligence, we've also developed the ability to have a, a big impact and leave a big footprint on the, uh, on the environment. And one of the really uh, concerning things that is occurring is, you know, as we continue to consume fossil fuels at an accelerated rate is the amount of carbon that we're actually putting into the Earth's atmosphere. And so that's an interaction that we need to be aware of and you know our basically our behaviors and the way that we um, interact with the other organisms on the planet and the environment uh, definitely has an impact on, the, on a global scale something to consider. The last uh, theme that we'll discuss is uh, the theme of evolution. And there's a quote from Theodos Dobzhansky that I think illustrates how important evolutionary theory is to, uh, to biology. And uh, he said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. 
I think one of the uh, real strengths of evolutionary theory is uh, that it explains patterns of both unity and diversity in living organisms. And so we see a, a commonality in all living organisms uh, because of our relationship and DNA is a pretty uh, strong piece of evidence that, that kind of uh, provides support for all living organisms being related. But we also have an explanation for diversity in living organisms uh, through evolutionary theory and, and that really is uh, the process of natural selection where populations are changing through time based on environmental pressures that are uh, selecting for certain favorable traits or characteristics. And over time, those traits or characteristics uh, become established and change depending on environmental pressures as the environment changes. And so that's uh, one of the really, I think, uh, important components of evolutionary theory in terms of its contributions to biology. So, the remarkable diverse forms on this planet basically arose, arose through evolutionary processes uh, that have been happening really since uh, the beginning of life on the planet some 3.5 billion years ago. And so those natural selection, environmental pressures began working on organisms uh, pretty much as soon as life arose on the planet and continue to do so today. So there's been about 1.7 million species identified and named, but there's no doubt much uh, more to be learned about uh, biodiversity and species diversity on the planet. And that number, 1.7 million, is really a dynamic number because new species are continuing to evolve there's still species out there that we haven't discovered yet that we don't know about and also unfortunately there are species that are being lost to extinction uh, primarily through habitat, habitat destruction and invasive species and other factors that are causing us to lose species at an accelerated rate today so that number will continue to change. Um, careful analysis of form and function basically is used to classify living organisms and uh, just recently you know within the last 30 years or so uh, we have a new tool in our tool bag in terms of how we group and uh, classify organisms and that's the ability to look at DNA sequences and so prior to the 1980s and 1990s when this ability to uh, compared genomes was available, organisms were based primarily on what they look like and, you know, behavior. And so if it looked like a duck, acted like a duck, and, you know, quacked like a duck, then it was a duck. And so organisms were categorized basically on morphology or what they look like and also behavior. But now we can kind of peek in at the genome and actually group and classify organisms based on similarities and, uh, in DNA and that's a been a really powerful tool to help us to understand you know how organisms are related from an evolutionary perspective which is really where taxonomy is going today uh, it's called phylogenetic systematics but uh, for our purposes just know that you know we group and classify these organisms and try to understand the biodiversity and of uh, the life forms on the planet through this process of uh, taxonomy Today, basically, biologists uh, divide the kingdoms of life at a level just a, even higher than the kingdom level. And, um, oh, the Whitaker's Five Kingdoms uh, scheme you guys may be familiar with uh, has been revised, and those revisions really started to take place in the 1980s and the 1990s as a, a person by the name of Carl Woosey started to look at Oh, molecular differences and he said that we need to really consider breaking these different types of life forms out even above the kingdom level and he established a, a taxonomical scheme that included what was called domains and so he has a three domain classification scheme which is pretty widely accepted today uh, the three domains are bacteria archaea and eukarya 
two of the three domains, bacteria and archaea, are prokaryotes. And remember, prokaryotes are these organisms that don't have a, a membrane-bound nucleus. They're all unicellular, but there are enough differences between two of these major groups of bacteria uh, to warrant putting them into uh, different groups, even above the kingdom level. And the breaking out of uh, prokaryotes into two groups really was based on several different things, but cell wall characteristics, um, ribosomal RNA, differences in ribosomal RNA and molecular differences uh, were really used to justify uh, splitting prokaryotes into two groups above the, the kingdom level into these two domains. And then the third domain contains all of the uh, eukaryotic organisms. So those organisms that have uh, eukaryotic cells or cells with a true membrane-bound nucleus are placed in the domain eukarya. Within the domain eukarya, you have kind of these traditional kingdoms, uh, which we got from Whitaker in the 1960s, that included uh, plantea, fungi, and animalia. Now there was an additional kingdom that Whitaker used that he called protista. And today, evolutionary taxonomists have kind of, mm, protista has fallen out of favor. And right now they're looking at trying to regroup and uh, recategorize a lot of these organisms that had formerly been in the kingdom protista. Protists are basically primarily unicellular organisms. Um, they have a variety of metabolic pathways, uh, heterotrophic and autotrophic feeding strategies, uh, but they are all eukaryotes. And so that is one thing that all protists have in common. But major revisions kind of going on in the taxonomy of that particular group of organisms today. This shows uh, kind of a couple of graphics that uh, illustrate the three domains of life. And so you have the two domains that are prokaryotes, the bacteria, and uh, the archaea, or the prokaryotes. And then here are the four groups of eukaryotes. And these are really the traditional kingdoms from, um, from Whitaker's old five kingdom uh, scheme. And so you have the plantea, fungi, and animalia and then the old protists who really haven't found a home uh, just quite yet. This is called a phylogenetic tree and it's really meant to illustrate evolutionary relationships and so these branching points uh, represent a common ancestor and so this would have been a common ancestor for the bacteria and the archaea, the two groups of prokaryotes and this particular tree shows uh, the domain eukarya being more closely related to archaea uh, than bacteria, but uh, the jury, I think, is still out on this a little bit, and we'll discuss later the the role that horizontal gene transfer has kind of played in uh, in the evolution of organisms in our uh, history. So, We get back to this kind of idea of unity and diversity, which falls under this theme of, of evolution. And you know, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but DNA kind of you know, is one of those things that illustrates a relationship between living organisms. And the other thing that we can kind of look back to that shows a, a relationship and a record of how life has changed through time is the fossil record. And so the fossils really document the evolution of life over, you know, 3.5 billion years. We place the date of the Earth and really our solar system at about 4.5, 4.6 billion years, but we don't start to see the first fossil evidence of life until about 3.5 billion years. Now the fossil record can kind of give us this oh, glimpse into the past and what life looked like and and we can uh, infer, you know, which species, you know, evolved before uh, the other one based on how we find the fossils in the rock strata. It's kind of like peeling back layers of wallpaper and we know that the wallpaper that's underneath is a little bit older than the wallpaper that's on top. But it doesn't really give us uh, necessarily an, 
a date or a time that we can uh, place on those particular organisms. The way that we date the planet and the way that we date uh, basically fossil records is uh, through a process called radiometric dating. And radiometric dating kind of acts like a, oh, it's basically like a molecular clock where we can look at the decay rate of uh, radioactive uh, isotopes. And so you hear a lot about carbon-14. And radioactive isotopes essentially are these elements that give off subatomic sub particles at a known rate. So if we know that there was a certain percentage of uh, carbon or carbon-14 um, in a sample or a piece of material or in a fossil or in, in a rock strata, and we know what percentage of that carbon-14 has decayed into another element, and we know the rate of decay, then we can start to place a date on that rock strata and or those fossils. Carbon-14 is one that's used for, you know, more recent, uh, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years. I'm not sure about the exact half-life, but there are other uh, radioactive isotopes that have much longer half-lives that we can go back millions and even billions of years to, uh, to date the rock strata and the age of the planet and the fossil records. So that uh, brings us to a little bit more, um, I guess, specifics about Darwin and his theory of evolution. And uh, there was obviously other people um, that contributed to our understanding of evolutionary processes. Alfred Wallace uh, was someone who was working, you know, about the same time Darwin was and, and really had a pretty good grasp on natural selection as well. But Darwin, and I think, uh, you know, justifiably so, gets a lot of credit for uh, his work on evolutionary theory. In 1859, he uh, published his kind of major piece of work on evolution, which is uh, Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And in his publication, he made really two main points, and that was that species showed evidence of descent with modification. So through time, species, not individuals, but species or populations um, were changing. And so uh, life wasn't fixed. There was kind of this perpetual change through time as evidenced in the fossil record. And you can even see it within a few generations uh, in some species. And um, his mechanism for this change, uh, he described as natural selection, which uh, basically pointed to and, and really started uh, biologists to focus on environmental pressures that were selecting for favorable traits through time. And so uh, Darwin's theory again is this, uh, an evolutionary theory in general is I think a very powerful explanation for the unity and diversity of, of life on the planet. Darwin made several observations that were important to his ideas and thoughts about the evolutionary process. A couple of these observations included understanding that there was variability within populations and that variability could be passed on from one generation to the next. So if you take a close look at these uh, two different species on the left, the top one is a marine, well these are both marine fish, but the one on the top is uh, a species called jack mackerel, and then the one down below in the basket is a, a species of a marine fish, the Pacific sardine. And if you, uh, if you make a careful observation of these uh, individuals within each of these species, you'll notice that there's variability within the species. And so there's variability in coloration, there's variability in size, even among the same year class. There's variability in um, camouflage patterns. And, and so even though you may have members of the same species, even members of the same year class in the same species, you will see variability in these groups. And it's that variability that gives some individuals within the species a competitive advantage. And so Darwin also observed that there were many more offspring that were produced than could survive. 
and so there was a inherently a competition between members of the same species but also competition between members of different species and those organisms that had a competitive advantage had something um, some variation uh, in their genome that gave them a competitive advantage were going to be more likely to survive and it was those uh, competitive advantages those adaptations that allowed those individuals within those populations to survive and reproduce and pass on those traits and those characteristics to the next generation and so through time we see an accumulation of those traits and those characteristics uh, in a species and the environment is constantly placing selective pressure for favorable traits in these species now this is a bit of a, I'm not sure it's the greatest example of natural selection because every time man gets involved in the equation we kind of, because of our ability to uh, kind of alter our environment and we have, uh, you know, this level of intelligence that allows us to, to sometimes interact with nature that we don't necessarily follow all of the same rules, um, you know, that uh, the majority of the organisms in uh, the natural environment follow with respect to evolution but uh, make no mistake we're still part of the evolutionary process but Darwin inferred that individuals that are best suited to their environment they're more likely to survive and so if you're a deer and you're born as an albino you know one of the traits that deers have that allow them to survive is camouflage and so if you're a deer or a rabbit or probably really anything in nature that depends on camouflage for your survival, uh, if you have that type of mutation, you're probably not going to survive very long. And, but those organisms with better camouflage are going to have a competitive advantage, more likely to survive, and they're going to pass on those traits or those characteristics. This uh, next sequence of slides, there's a couple of them here that basically are meant to illustrate uh, some of the principles of natural selection. And so you can see here that you have a, a population of beetles and there's variability in the coloration of the beetles. Uh, the background or the environment is a dark background and some of the beetles have a darker color so uh, are better camouflaged against that dark background. But within any population you have this variability and some of the beetles are lighter in color and so this shows uh, kind of the process of uh, nature selecting for the favorable traits that were actually maybe selecting against the less favorable traits is the beetles with a, a lighter color are taking a, a higher predation rate and so eventually through time the population that darker color becomes more established in the population if the environment is placing selective pressure on that particular trait or characteristic. And uh, so those that are better suited, better adapted to the environment, more likely to survive, they're going to reproduce. When they reproduce, they're going to pass on those favorable traits or characteristics. But the thing to know about um, natural selection in the environment and environmental pressures is um, the environment doesn't always stay the same and so there's a, a kind of a classic study done of um, a peppered moth and I think this was done in Europe maybe in England where they were looking at um, basically the uh, the numbers of uh, peppered moths in nature uh, related to coloration and in the um, in the late 1800s early 1900s uh, the primarily favorable color for peppered moss was a lighter color uh, because the uh, the bark on the trees was you know basically a, a lighter colored bark and so if you were a peppered moth that you know with a lighter coloration you had a better camouflage a better um, chance to survive and reproduce and pass on that coloration but in the late 1800s, early 1900s, with the Industrial Revolution, they started to burn a lot of coal. And as that uh, carbon started to accumulate, those fine carbon particulate matter started to accumulate in the, in the environment and in the atmosphere, the coloration on the trees became darker. And now all of a sudden, uh, 
uh, the lighter colored moths were taking a higher predation load because they stood out and so something in the environment had changed and the environment was actually selecting uh, for the trait of a darker coloration in the moths and so that was you know this example of how you know there was a change in the environment that uh, was influenced the the selective pressure uh, and predation on this particular species of peppered moss they came back and they looked at the same species of uh, moth in the 1960s late 1960s 1970s and after the clean air act was passed and uh, we started to clean up our act just a little bit with more environmental regulations in the late 60s, early 70s. The coloration on the trees actually began to uh, lighten a little bit and we saw uh, this population of peppered moths. Now all of a sudden if you had dark coloration you were starting to take a higher predation load because you were on this um, lighter colored background and we saw the dominant or the wild type uh, coloration of a lighter coloration become the, the dominant uh, trait or characteristic in that particular species of uh, peppered moths. So just because a, a trait might be favorable today it doesn't mean that it, it will necessarily be favorable you know in the future depending on how uh, environmental pressures change. So that's kind of a classic example of natural selection in this uh, peppered moth population. There was a biologist by the name of Ernst Meyer that uh, was working, he was at an Ivy League school and I think he did a lot of this work in the, um, oh, the 1980s and the 1990s. And what he did, and I, I hope what you'll do is you, you think a little bit about evolutionary theory is, is don't maybe necessarily see it as this single theory, but see it as a, um, kind of a combination of uh, several theories and so what Meyer did was he went in and he broke down uh, Darwinian evolution and he proposed that there were five major sub theories and so as you begin to learn more about evolutionary theory I hope you'll you'll look at these and you may there may be parts of evolutionary theory that uh, make more sense to you or more intuitive to you and are you know are more willing to to kind of embrace and uh, I would encourage you to come at this from an educated uh, perspective and those parts that make sense to you you know by all means uh, you know uh, take those to heart and if you know there's parts of it that you know maybe you don't feel as strongly about or can't embrace as much then you know that's part of the process of science and and kind of uh, you know, as we go through time, you know, we'll never find out that evolutionary processes aren't happening, but we may and will continue to kind of change our understanding of, of how these processes work. So Meyer's five sub theories of Darwinian evolution, the first one is perpetual change. And so he said that living organisms aren't, you know, fixed, uh, that life changes through time. And probably the best evidence that we have of perpetual change is a fossil record. So it would be very hard to argue that uh, life is not changing through time. We can see it written in the fossil records. And you can go back, you know, 70, 80 million years ago, and we have these, you know, very rich fossil records of the dinosaurs. And then at about 65 million years ago, we see those dinosaurs dying out and really that uh, mass extinction that occurred in the, on the KT boundary and the Cretaceous tertiary boundary about 65 million years ago. And then we see mammals start to become kind of more of the dominant life form uh, once the dinosaurs disappear. So perpetual change, I think, is pretty well established and that's a, a component of evolutionary theory. Common descent, uh, this is the one that sometimes people will have a little bit of trouble with, uh, especially if you're coming at it from a creationist perspective. Uh, but common descent basically says that all living organisms descend, descended from a single common ancestor. And one of the best pieces of evidence I think to support this is, is really we go back to that old uh, saw of the DNA and all living organisms using DNA as their uh, chemical information uh, system. Uh, 
multiplication of species we see this through different processes you know, there's a process called allopatric speciation where uh, if you have a, a species of salamander or a species of fish or a species of bird that becomes uh, geographically isolated say a mountain range pops up and divides one population of uh, salamanders uh, into two different geographical areas over time those two different groups will evolve to their local environment through natural selection and if enough time goes by and enough changes happen um, and those species evolve basically into two new species where they uh, had one time been an individual single individual species um, then that's one way speciation uh, can and does occur and so we see that and we can actually witness that. Gradualism is a kind of another one of these sub theories and uh, in order for some of these evolutionary processes to occur they can't happen in a matter of maybe you know a hundred years or a thousand years and and so for gradualism to um, to really be a viable explanation of how species change you have to have long long periods of time and so that's what that radiometric dating kind of provides us with and you know we think of the age of the you know the planet now and not thousands of years or even millions of years but uh, really billions of years and about 4.6 billion years and so life has been around a long time and so some of these slower evolutionary processes you know have had time to ch uh, to progress and over large periods of time you know small changes can eventually add up to, to pretty big differences and then a, another way that species change and evolve through time again and one of the I think the main pieces of uh, Darwinian theory and evolution is natural selection and that's the one that we've kind of uh, hammered on a little bit on those last few slides and my own interpretation of it and there's a lot more that can go on and in, uh, into this but basically those organisms that are best adapted to their environment uh, tend to outcompete uh, members of their own species or members of different species they survive they reproduce and they pass on those traits or those characteristics uh, to their offspring and so evolution is kind of this continuous process and it's you know those organisms are changing based on environmental pressures and stresses uh, through time one of the things uh, to take away from this is that you know populations and species change through time and it's really a change in the genetic makeup uh, through generations that uh, the is a, the, a part of the evolutionary process an individual doesn't change and you know an individual member of the population of the species they don't really involve uh, evolve or change the DNA that they have that you're born with essentially that's the DNA that you ha um, have from you know when you start to when you finish and but the genomes and the, the population uh, the favorable traits in a population can kind of move and change through time based on environmental pressures. So that concludes uh, the first of uh, the sequence of PowerPoint notes. End of chapter one basically and we'll pick up with the second part of this on chapter 24 with uh, oh, early life and diversification of prokaryotes. <laughs>